and it seemed like they were talking either through just rhetoric, or ideology, or lobby influence, and not person to person. So the ultimate aim of this project is to, uh, to, to bring this facilitation, this experiential democracy encounter, one-on-one -on -one encounter between legislators who are on contrasting sides of an issue of moral import, or community activists who are on contrasting sides, and help them as a part of their general deliberative process to have a sacred space where they can face each other again as human beings in a more intimate setting hopefully a safer setting, to really try to understand each other, where each other is coming from, and not just intellectually, not just rhetorically. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I personally would much rather know that people who have my life in their hands, in terms of sending me to war, or sending fellow country people to war, putting us in harm's way on a number of levels, whether it has to do with war, or it has to do with uh, industrial contamination, or it has to do with uh, our medical system. I personally would feel much more secure if I knew that the people who are leading these, these causes and these directions had at least spent some time personally encountering the issue and, and each other about the issue. And I will acknowledge right up front, I, I am a uh, psychotherapist, I'm a psychologist. So obviously, I do have a bias toward, uh, in particular, depth therapeutic principles, meaning that I do work at a, at a deeper level with clients to help them become more present to the parts of themselves that they cut off, that are other to them. And I have a strong belief that a lot of the divisiveness and fragmentation we're seeing in our culture has to do with wounding, personal wounding, that drives people to become absolutist and uh, dogmatic and sometimes even tyrannical, or to try to live through leaders who lean in those directions and who are often coming from their own wounding in the same way. And you almost have a perfect storm of cultural wounding and a leader's wounding <clears throat> that moves society toward often very destructive circumstances. So to bring that back into our circle, first of all, I deeply appreciate that you're all here will be a part of this experience. Um, this is, has also grown into a task force that I started with Division 32 of the APA. And unfortunately, we don't have all the members of the task force here. They include Sean Rubin, David St. John, Rhonda McGee, who is a, an attorney at the uh, University of San Francisco and practices mind, mindfulness law. I think most of you know Sean Rubin and David St. John, or at least you have an idea there, with our, our humanistic psychology community. Uh, and Lisa Vallejos, who is somewhere here. Yes. And we have two new members of our task force on experiential democracy, and that is Nathaniel Granger on my right and Roger Brume on my left. I should disclose that I know both of these folks fairly well. And I am ex 
extremely appreciative to them for offering their beings to this demonstration. And uh, hopefully, this could provide a sample, an educated sample, to legislators or community activists out in the broader social world that our task force will be pursuing to uh, provide this kind of training and perhaps ultimately uh, help it become part of a natural part of the deliberative process. I mean, if we're talking democracy, why shouldn't we be talking about the deeper dimensions of democracy, like facing each other as human beings, and not just abstract speakers in huge halls? Now, of course, details have to be worked out about how this can be integrated into such a formal, deliberative body. But I'm told from Rhonda McGee, our attorney, that uh, it's possible. Uh, so we're going to be pursuing that. So in the interest of time, and this is obviously a delicate process, we want to give time for the demonstration and then time to open it up audience discussion. I'm going to move into this very soon, but I also want to mention that uh, if this is particularly stirring for any of you uh, to the point where you feel you need to touch base with one of us here, uh, Lisa Vallejos has, has offered her time immediately after this gathering to speak with you. And you can feel free to contact me as well. If you so we'll, we'll begin here. It's always good to have a glass of water. Again. <coughs> I hope you'll, you'll be able to hear us okay. If not, just feel free to move up front now, a little closer. Now I should mention, I also should mention that uh, Roger is an ex-policeman, current policeman also, but uh, in the past has trained police as well, as well has been a policeman in the community. And Nathaniel has been a social activist for a substantial period of time and uh, also grew up uh, in the south side of Chicago. And so they clearly have uh, personal, respective personal experiences of community policing, and that is the focus of our topic today, is the experience of community policing. So to begin this process, I'd like all of us to just take a moment to take a full breath, get centered in our bodies, a chance for a few seconds. So in the first part of this facilitation, I'm going to ask our participants to take about five minutes to relate their experience of community policing in as mindful and heartful a way as possible. 
to the other party. And then I'm going to ask the other party to reflect back what he heard, and not just heard, but felt or sensed about what the original speaker was trying to bring up. So the idea is to tune in with one's whole body experience to where the other is coming from. And then the original speaker will have a chance to uh, correct or revise what the other party has reflected back. And then we're going to switch. <coughs> so I'd like to begin with Roger first, if you would, in describing again as mindfully and heartfully as possible your experience of community policing to Nathaniel. Well, my experience with community policing goes back a lot of years. It's been a, lot, a long, long time since um, I was involved in it, but I, re I really kind of going back to the, my initial impression of it. Um, it was probably the late 80s, early 90s that community policing um, emerged within uh, law enforcement. And I recall that this was, um, this was our administration's new program. A lot of us have devoted a lot of our time and a lot of our efforts to become trained, um, and most specifically trained, trained as crime fighters. Our idea of community policing was quick response and take action on behalf of the people who are victims. And what we got with community policing was uh, a lot of uh, messages of going out and socializing with people in the neighborhoods. And I remember we had conversations among us um, but this was just really misdirected. It was really, uh, again, another, what I would say now is bureaucratic patchwork or another program just to, to have something to say that you're making progress. Uh, but it did, didn't really, there was, there was nothing really sold to us about it except that um, this was going to be a way to uh, make neighborhoods safer by involving the public. By involving the public, that initially created anxiety for us because um, sometimes the public doesn't always make the best decisions in emergency situations. And um, I come from a state where we have open carry laws of guns, we have um, very individualist culture, and uh, the idea of having, you know, uh, the neighborhood get involved really was a lot more like. Uh, encouraging sort of a, a partnership with vigilante kind of, kind of thing. It was, that was a potential. And like, well, we really don't want citizens getting involved because citizens um, getting involved in the hurt and we'll be the ones that hurt them. Um, the other thing was is this idea that we had trained so hard and we took our job so seriously that now we were kind of expected to go out and meet with neighborhood groups and, and have lemonade and kind of thing and we thought it would, is this really that good of the use of our time? Just to write a traffic ticket takes 20 to 25 minutes and um, there there's so few resources and we often uh, patrolled under staff so that there was not enough people out there. There was no backup sometimes on calls and yet now we're going to take on this kind of, um, you know, go out to the public and, and make the public feel better about, I don't know, about the police department. We really looked at it as it was a PR thing and not really anything that would accomplish it. So um, I felt resistant to it um, initially because I thought it was a waste of my skills and a waste of my time. And I thought that it was really encouraging citizens to get involved in a way that could very easily be uh, counterproductive and um, wasn't really going to give us uh, what we wanted, but it would ultimately get a good in the papers and it made the police department look like it was trying to be more friendly. And at that period of time, this was very short, uh, shortly after um, a lot of the media attention on Rodney King happened. And so becoming a, a, a nicer, friendlier police department was really what um, the people in the suburbs where I work, was really what they were looking for. And uh, we as patrol officers, uh, specifically I worked night shift, 
I was painfully aware that uh, even in our quiet little mm -hmm. town, there was a whole lot going on in that quiet little town that <coughs> a lot of citizens didn't know was going on. A lot of really dangerous stuff, a lot of horrible things. And so I, my, my first experience with um, community policing is that it was just a, a program. It was a program like a lot of other programs. It was sort of trendy, and um, it would probably go away. Eventually, what it did, it turned out to be an assignment that officers took. So that what we had is we had uh, COP, or community-oriented police officers, that worked with community leaders and those kind of things. But we very rarely, in standard patrol, heard much from them or did much with them. We still were out handling radio calls because the radio calls just come and come and come. And that's what you do every day is you handle radio calls um, and any kind of non thing. So, I didn't have a lot of faith in, in community police, and I, I didn't have a lot of faith in the people that I saw that were coming to the table from the community that really wanted to get involved. Uh, a lot of those um, people ended up being um, neighborhood complainers. They complained about everything. They were people that were in the neighborhood that complained about every kid on the neighborhood was casing their house or whatever, and particularly with respect to minority youth, I can't tell you how many times I got called because a, a minority teenager walked past somebody's house and we had the community oriented police in contact or the neighborhood watch or whatever on the phone with dispatch having us get out there right away because there was a suspicious person and it turned out to be a teenager walking on the sidewalk. And then, you know, we'd have to say, you can't do anything about a teenager walking on the sidewalk and there would be this uh, So it was a very rock and hard place kind of thing. Okay, thank you. I need to cut it at this point and ask Nathaniel if you can feed back to Roger, again, as mindfully as possible, what you heard Roger expressing, conveying, trying to almost get into his shoes. What I heard from, from Roger was he was put into a position of community policing that he didn't have much faith in at the outset. And in uh, part of this community policing, this project was to uh, include citizens and to focus on socializing uh, communities with the help of citizen involvement. And in theory, it sounds as if it is a great idea to get everyone on board um, as far as this community policing. But I get, a, I get the sense from you that you felt that it was a, a uh, tool for chaos or, or the, it, it was as if you saw something down the line that this is not a great idea because citizens' lives would be put in harm's way and, and uh, the idea of socializing communities which should be left to the law enforcement and not community involvement and citizen involvement. And help me understand this because there is another area that I feel you mentioned briefly about minorities and the, the young teen walking down the street. As you were as you were talking, I got a sense that you recognized the uh, the disparities as far as who within the community should be socialized and who should be a part of the socializing. And it stands to reason that the teenager walking down the street who had the calls because he looked suspicious, this minority teen, was not part of the process of socializing, but rather he was targeted, which further added to your, 
your anxiety around the whole idea of community policing. Okay. Roger, could you give feedback to Nathaniel about whether he captured your perspective well or reasonably well? Or is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I think he captured it well. It was, um, you know, we were committed to uh, equal protection under the law. We were trained to do that. We were, this was an ideal. And then going into neighborhoods, the reality was is that people would call and they'd say, well, this is suspicious behavior. Well, their idea of suspicious behavior and our idea of suspicious behavior was not the same. And so um, it did. It, it felt like that, that the reason why uh, we were called, and again, this comes back to a, a use of resources. You know, we're going out there with tools and equipment and knowledge and training to answer somebody's anxiety about a minority that walks down the street. That's part of our community, and that community uh, that there was a particular. Um, how did you say it? I don't know how you said it. What I would say is there's a particular community that was to be socialized and everybody else and the minority um, youth was part of that somebody else and, um, and not the uh, you know not the standard you know, suburban but you know what we often say nowadays taxpayer of course I think is an interesting way to put it too. Okay. Okay, so Nathaniel would you take about five minutes I was in Head Start going into kindergarten. One of the first lessons I learned was if ever I would find myself in trouble, to look for Officer Friendly. Officer Friendly was the prototype of my savior. If I could just find Officer Friendly. As a little boy, I was at an amusement park in Chicago called Riverview. My babysitters took off, and I was waiting to get on the Ferris wheel. I was holding on to a hand as the line inched closer and closer to the Ferris wheel. When I got to the front of the line, I, with excitement, I looked up at my babysitter, and it turned out it wasn't my babysitter was an old white man whose hand I had been holding all of that time. I took off running through the amusement, the amusement park only to find Officer Friendly, knowing that if I found Officer Friendly, everything would be all right. And lo and behold, at the concession stand, I ran into a white cop. I gave him my phone number, my address. He called home and babysitters came back and got this little black boy and took me home. I had all faith in Officer Friendly. But as time went on on the south side of Chicago, I grew quickly to fear Officer Friendly. The one who uh, had on the side of his automobile, we serve and protect, protect, became my enemy. And I felt the overwhelming presence of fear whenever I was in the presence of Officer Friendly. That fear continued through my teenage life as times we were run just when a police car would come down the street. It wasn't that we were doing anything wrong. It wasn't that we were breaking any law. But we knew because of our suspicious look and the color of our skin, we were already guilty before proven innocent. And as a result, the police became part of the establishment, the establishment in which I could never be a part of. Even if I were to get an education, even if I were to uh, 
transcend the life of the inner city, inner, inner city ghetto, I will still be marked by reason of my suspicious look, be it the hoodie, be it the dreads, be it the uniform that I cannot take off. And it led me to have a sense of fear, a sense of dread that goes far beyond healthy paranoia. Yes, I should be a little paranoid whenever I'm in the presence of a cop, healthy paranoia. But I shouldn't be afraid to the extent where I'm praying and I'm asking God, please don't let me get tased today. Please don't let me get shot 16 times in the back. Please don't let something happen. And that fear is exacerbated when I look at my sons, young black men, I fear for their lives maybe 10, 10, 10 times more than I do my own as to what could happen to them in the face of those who serve and protect. Thank you. Roger, could you feed back to Nathaniel what you heard Nathaniel expressing? start with a um, characterization, and I invite you to correct this if it's not correct, but um, Nathaniel, you painted a, a, just a picture, to me, a description of a loss of innocence, that an, an innocence that was initially trusted, um, some might even say naive, but a belief in a character or a belief in a persona that was actually confirmed for you the first time you ever tried it. And then over time, uh, lost faith in that persona mm -hmm. and found that uh, police officers weren't friendly. And they, they really were actually quite menacing. And to the point that you became to fear for your physical safety anytime there was a, a, an opportunity or there was a presence of a police officer. It didn't matter who that police officer was anymore to you. Uh, the uniform that the police officer wears and takes off every night um, represented um, something menacing to you. Uh, and that that, that menacing uh, created so much uh, fear, you call healthy fear. And that uh, is that, that there is a a reasonable and rational caution that you feel, but that you've always tried to keep that not to the point that it, it, it was so far that it, it took, took you over or that it, it, it suppressed you, but it was still there. Now as a father, you're in the role of a protector, and your principal concern is protecting your black sons from the community. Absolutely. There, there is a, um, there's something that you said that, that, that grabs you and really stands out to me, and it's the uniform. It is the, it is what that uniform represents. The uniform, to me, doesn't represent simply the police department. It doesn't simply represent law enforcement. It represents a society that is plagued with systemic racism, oppression, degradation. It represents something deeper than serve and protect. And that's what scares me. And and what really scares me is the fact that at the end of the day, your, your uniform, which represents menacing, 
you can take it off. But what really scares me is that my uniform, which represents menacing, thuggetry, rioting behavior, I can't take it off. And it really freaks me out that my son cannot take off his uniform. And that really scares me. I remember as a little boy, I remember buying Ambi because I tried to change the uniform. I tried to lighten it up or bleach it. Or maybe if I could change the uniform, maybe I would be looked upon as less menacing. Maybe I could be looked upon as, as not being a thug. And to no avail, of course, I could not, I could not become light enough. I could not become white enough. I could not become part of the establishment enough, even after getting an education. And I still feel that when I'm pulled over by a cop, the first thing that comes to my mind is not that a tail light was miss is, is missing, not that my tags are expired or if I get proof of insurance, but first thing that comes to my mind is that I'm a black man being pulled over by this white cop. Am I going to live through this situation? And that scares me. I don't know what a bad guy looks like. And I learned very, very early in my career. And I started as a police officer seven days after I turned 21 years old. I'll turn 48 in two weeks. So I've been in law enforcement for 27 years. So I don't know how good my mouth is. It's been a while. I've been a police officer more of my adult life than I've not been. And I remember an academy instructor telling me that, you know, there's two ways you lose your, your job in the police world, and that is to be killed or to be politically killed. And that uh, if you cross the wrong white person, they'll take your job. But if you cross a black person, they'll take your life. That was 1988 when I was told that. And I thought that that was really, really, that struck me as being very, very jaded. But even today, so many years later, I still remember that guy saying that and how much he believed it. Perhaps that speaks to what you call the establishment. Um, I also remember when we were taught about people with tattoos. The tattoos meant that people were either in military service or that they were thugs. And in 1988, people that had tattoos were either motorcycle people or they were military people. It was a good place to start with sorting people out, particularly if you saw and got to learn to recognize jailhouse tattoos. When I was 20 years old, I worked at the Utah State Prison, and I learned behavior, and I learned language, and I learned a culture that was there that was not anywhere else. But when I saw it on the street, I identified it very, very quickly. to the point that even a, a friend of mine, I befriended a guy at the gym and we worked out together. And when he would call me boss, it would bother me. And I said, I wish you wouldn't say that. Because I worked at the prison and this is what that feels like when you do that. It creates, it, it puts me in that position of being on the other side. <clears throat> he later told me he had done seven years in prison. So, um, I was a young officer, and he was a young ex-convict. He'd served his time, and we became very good friends. But what I learned through that is that uh, I don't know what a bad guy looks like. I've uh, dealt with clergy that molested children, um, which was a huge loss of innocence for me. Um, I saw men beat women that they were supposed to love unrecognizably sometimes with weapons. Um, the, 
the number of, of rapes that would happen every year within our city. It was not a very big city, but the number of rapes that we would investigate in our city in a year never made the news. Nobody was ever ever knew about um, it was amazing. And then there's the traffic encounter that you talked about. And the one thing I know about a traffic encounter is you don't know who you're stopping. You never know who you're stopping. And if they have tinted windows, it's even a later time until you know who you're stopping. Um, I've stopped menacing white people that were in suits that turned out to be a bigger problem than anybody wearing their hat backwards or having tattoos. Um, I nearly shot a 17-year-old one night because of a traffic encounter and the way things um, unfolded on that traffic stop. Uh, he reached into the dark, I heard metal hit the seat belt and I thought, I was, I thought it was done. Um, this was uh, a few weeks after a friend of mine had, uh, had shot a young man who the young man survived, but he shot a young man on a, on a crime in progress. Um, so I don't know who, what bad guys look like. Um, I really don't. I don't know what kind of cars they drive. They drive a lot of different cars. Um, the one thing that I do know is the better bad guys learn to blend. Um, the, the beginner bad guys like to wear a bad guy uniform. The thugs in the neighborhood like to, like to advertise that they're tough guys but the real ones that are real dangerous really into organized crime. And they certainly don't sweat patrol officers. They think that we're, we just do traffic stuff and we do the radio calls, but their level of crime is so much deeper and so much more sinister that uh, it has nothing to do with neighborhood watch. We're talking about major drug things and stuff like that. So I saw that in my own community. And so that's what I reflect back to you is I don't know what a bad guy looks like. I don't think a bad guy looks like anything. I, I, I hear that, <clears throat> but then also I also hear that um, the the message that was instilled in you early on, um, you still remember those words that you know the white legislator the white legislator will take your job, but the black man will take your life. And it stands to reason that even though, you know, I hear you say that you don't know what a bad guy looked like, somehow it was instilled in you that you know that the black man will take your life. And that's the bad guy. It's not so much the one who will take your job, but it's the one who will take your life. And my question is, how does that impact your behavior as a cop, knowing that Perhaps this white gentleman might take my job, but this black man will take my life. Does that dictate your behavior towards one, differentiate your behavior towards one from another, or how you behave? I found what that academy instructor said, and I think for me, and this is personal, being a White suburban officer. You know, I don't. I don't work in the inner city of anywhere. I never have. So I want to qualify that. But um, I found that to be not true. I found it to not be true. In fact, what I found is that it was a lot more the opposite. That um, stopping a black man on a traffic stop was more likely to generate a complaint with my chief than stopping a white man. And. That created a certain amount of anxiety, too. But now, all of a sudden, this traffic encounter, I didn't quite know how this was going to go. I didn't know if I was going to walk up and be met with uh, you know, um, a friendly conversation, uh, a neutral conversation, or a contentious conversation. So um, traffic stops. They th and I'll also say this. I think um, most citizens, um, a traffic stop is a traumatic event for them. For me, when I see blue and blue and reds in my mirror, I get anxious, you know. And I also know that this young officer that's going to walk up to the window is going to ask me for my license and registration, and I have a pistol in my car. And um, so that changes my conversation with him too. You know, I have to I have to modify my behavior and talk to to the officer in, in a way that um, communicates. Well, I'm armed, but I'm a good guy. 
right. But again, police officers don't know what good guys and bad guys look like. So, um, you know, if I have a gun, they still have to sort that out with me. So there is an anxiety there. But um, what I found from the police officer side of it is that, yeah, there is, I understand the anxiety of being stopped. Um, but oftentimes, the average person's only encounter with police is that traffic stop. I just, I just wonder uh, what you both feel right now uh, facing each other, being here with each other, in each other's uniforms, in a sense. Uh, what your experience of each other is, given you've been brought up in uniform as a very powerful symbol, implied that it is as well. I wonder if there's anything you feel moved to say about being with each other right here and now. There's a, um, for me, there is, there is a, a perpetual state of confusion when I talk with you or someone like Rod, uh, who wears a uniform, who doesn't fit the cop schema that I have in my mind. And the cop schema in my mind is that you don't have my best interest at heart. But then the times that I've had to rely on cops, they more often than not prove to have my best interests at heart. And so I'm pulled in these different, uh, these different uh, polarities that, wow, this is a pretty good dude. I should trust him. In fact, I don't even want to live too far away from police, you know, just in case something happens in the neighborhood. But then, on the other hand, it just scares the crap out of me that that one bad cop will look at my uniform and size me up based on me looking suspicious because I'm different from, from, from them. And, uh, and it's not so much I, I'm afraid of the white cop, I'm more afraid of the white cop's fear of me. And because this white cop is afraid of me as a black man, they will do anything to, to, uh, to, to reduce that, that threat, even if it means taking my life, when I pose no threat whatsoever. And, and uh, so yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's not that I'm afraid of you, I'm afraid of your fear towards me. Well, Nathaniel's, um, uh, I understand what Nathaniel's saying, and, um, and I, I, I think it's valid, uh, particularly where we come from, very, very different worlds. The south side of Chicago is very, very different from where I grew up. Um, in fact, I remember an early lesson, we had uh, a black girl come into our high school, and one of the um, teachers said to the students, the white students, you know, it's really obvious that most of you are going out of your way to befriend this, this new student, but actually it was an overcompensation, you know, it was like a celebrity was in town because we had one black student and it was really almost paradoxically as insulting because if she had been a white student, maybe she would have had so many people so eager to be her friend. But the feeling that I have with the systemic part of it, and you, you call it the establishment, I refer to it as the bureaucracy. And now we have a police department that's going to have a new program. You know, um, we're going to hire more diverse, we're going we're to recruit more diverse, all of these things are, are frustrations because these are political solutions um, to what patrol officers experience as practical problems. I want to go out and I want to I want to catch bad guys and I want to put the bad guys in jail and I don't really care what color they are. But in the larger part of society, this is continually being um, pulled in.
get to where I even feel like Nathaniel, you and I have talked about this, so it's sort of cheap. But um, that right from the, the very beginning, that you recognize my uniform and I recognize yours, and we stand there together in a place that's a place of gathering that I've been invited to and you've been invited to, we have to work out the uniform thing before we can proceed as human beings instead of learn more about each other as human beings. Um, and that's not something you created. Um, it's not something I created. Um, but it's a source of fear, it's a source of frustration. There's a lot of negative emotions that come in with that because... Um, you, you feel a lot of negative emotions? I feel a lot of frustration. And uh, there's a lot of frustration that comes with that every single day. Um, every single, what's now a Facebook post, you know, now that social media is the way it is, there's a lot of things. Um, posted derogatory about police officers. And uh, I've seen YouTube video after YouTube video of a white police officer doing something that shocks my conscience. That uses an exemplar, if you will. What I hear Nathaniel saying is that his healthy fear or his healthy anxiety is that he recognizes that possibility. I recognize that possibility too, and I think those officers should go to jail. I think they should be convicted and they go to jail. Um, the other thing that, that I know is that because the system is a bureaucracy, it's bureaucratic, that whether I shoot somebody and it was, it was absolutely necessary or not, there's going to be a period of time that I'm going to be under trial and I'm going to be considered guilty until proven. I have friends that are considered guilty until proven innocent. And even though they've been exonerated by the authorities, they lost their jobs politically because it was not popular for the police department to put them on the, on the job. They have difficulty getting other jobs in police departments because that police department doesn't want to take the risk or have it go in the media that um, this officer now is working again, even though he was exonerated of any wrongdoing. So there's a lot of frustration that I feel uh, comes into that actually community policing and these kind of programs are creating a bigger wedge than, than they're doing anything. But at the end of the day, people who are instilling these kind of new policy makers are saying, we're doing something. And that they get a pass because they're doing something, but it's completely useless. We're, we're unfortunately in a limited time right now. Uh, if we were to go on, my sense is that I would pursue some of these very delicate issues or questions about each other's whiteness, blackness, what that brings up at, at deeper levels, and how that may figure into the mix of this question of experience of community police policing. Um, given our time, I'd like to move to the next phase of this, which is, and again as unfortunately as briefly as we can, do you feel like you've come to any sense of common ground? ideas about what could be helpful in regard to community policing, given your respective experiences? I, uh, I do. I think I'm very, uh, I'm actually very appreciative of, uh, of Rod, of Rod's uh, uh, admission mm -hmm. to what you would do to those cops. And so what I'm hearing, hearing from you is that just because they wear the badge, just because they wear the uniform, they're not good. And just because I wear this uniform, it doesn't automatically automatically make me bad. And so I appreciate that. That means a lot to me to hear that. And uh, as opposed to being stereotyped, that I'm bad because of my uniform and you're good because of yours. Do, do you feel that as well as here? I do, I do feel that, and I and I appreciate it. It doesn't uh, 
it doesn't uh, ameliorate again the fear. And if I could, if I could read this, it's only like two minutes. Can I read this? Sure. This is a poem that I wrote in reference to uh, community policing, entitled "What I," well, not entitled, but titled "What I Fear." What I fear. Are you so afraid of me? I mean, excuse me. Are you so afraid of my skin so brown? You use all possible means to keep me down. Are you so afraid you have to lock me up, keep me shackled, kick my butt? I'm not afraid of you. Let me make that clear. Your baseless fear of me is what I fear. Are you so afraid that I look suspicious that like a rabid dog, you attack so vicious. Getting autographs while let the gun show, while your victim marked absent, another no-show. Another black teen sleep in the mortuary. No remorse, your conscience clean, evil portuary. I'm not afraid of you. Let me make that clear. Your baseless fear of me is what I fear. You so afraid of the way I talk. You will kill me dead for the way I walk. Are you so afraid that I'll take your power when I simply want to bloom like any other flower? By George, I pray, remove this fear before another murder, a mother's graveside tear. I'm not afraid of you. Let me make that clear. Your baseless fear of me is what I fear. Roger, do you really have any more thoughts, feelings you'd like to express in this forum to Nathaniel about uh, a basis suggestion about what we'd like to see happen. 